of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At the record, so that all board members are present except Eric Brandberg. And we'll move on to number four board, board showcase with um, the Family Center. And we have Brian Johnson with us tonight. Welcome. Thanks, everybody. Very connected here. Former Princeton graduate. That's right. Brian Johnson. 98 proud. Been uh, 17 years since I uh, had the pleasure to do a presentation, so it's been a while, at least here. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. I am uh, I'm Brian Jolson, Community Ed Director here. I have the pri privilege to talk about community education as well as the Family Center, because uh, we kind of represent both areas. So. So community education is really about supporting, engaging, involving, creating new opportunities, providing safe spaces and having fun. And we, uh, we strive to do all those every single day to every single student and family member. We've uh, been working hard to uh, fill all our needs. We have a lot of new uh, faces and a lot of new family members uh, at the Family Center, including myself. Uh, we have Kayla Maring, who is our new community ed coordinator. Um, some new staff members, new teachers, new paras, and some new Tiger Club staff members. So uh, lots of new faces, and uh, they're all doing a great job. We got a great team going. Uh, pretty broad scope that we do. Uh, from adult basic ed, rec enrichment, aquatics, catalogs, uh, outreach programs, community sign, driver's education, early childhood, extended field trips, facility scheduling, hand in hand, tiger glove, youth rec enrichment. We won't go through all these in detail tonight, but I'll uh, touch on as many as I can and try not to keep you here till nine o'clock. Um, Angie Sanders uh, is in charge of our adult basic ed. Um, she uh, really emphasized to me when I came on board, it's not just about GEDs, it's about working with uh, all our adults and trying to increase involvement in, in um, not only their education, but child education as well. Um, trying to partner with businesses and uh, we, we partner with Cambridge, I, I say any, with the RAB. Um, this, this program, we're really working back, um, through, through COVID, uh, we, we were up around 20, 30 graduates. Um, we, we went down to about 10 last year, but we're trying to grow from there. As I mentioned, Kayla Marin is our, um, new community ed coordinator. She's doing a great job with our adult rec and enrichment. Um, this is a, a growth area for us, as I uh, have, have shared with uh, Don and Melissa on our Community Ed Advisory Council. Uh, this is a, a growth area for us. We're trying to incorporate uh, a lot of new programming for adults. Um, we uh, have, have surveyed those folks, surveyed different families. Um, we uh, incorporated 13 new different classes. Um, we have... Uh, 72 uh, different adults uh, that are new to our programming uh, through some uh, four different classes that we offered this fall and winter. And uh, uh, again, our, our focus is really from uh, birth through uh, that re retirement age and trying to target those folks. One other program that we brought back that uh, has been well received is uh, our walking in the school program. Uh, we, we are doing that uh, in the middle school and high school, uh, Monday through Fridays. So. Um, some other uh, partnerships that we've partnered with is uh, we've been working with uh, the chamber uh, and the city. 
We have a, a technology class that we uh, have just started up that we're pretty excited about. Uh, we are doing a, a lot of uh, uh, American Red Cross, uh, CPR, uh, as we come out of COVID uh, and try to make connections uh, and reach out and, make, and do those things. Um, we've done some other enrichment, cookie decorating, um, some, as we surveyed uh, our community members, uh, pickleball was a big one, and we've uh, brought that back. Uh, we have pickleball going, um, adult co-ed volleyball is one of our more popular classes, and then we have, we have pound fitness going as well. Uh, aquatics, uh, probably one of our most popular programs uh, in the summer uh, that continues to grow and is, is our most popular time. Um, with over 350 enrollments. Uh, fall, uh, we continue, obviously in the fall, we're, we're working around uh, girl swimming, so there's not as much time. And so when we have 23 classes, they're, they fill up pretty fast and we have a wait list and we work to get people off the wait list. And then uh, currently, uh, again, working around the boys swimming schedule uh, with some morning uh, opportunities and evening opportunities, but we're currently at about 140 as of January 1st. So, and we have about 30 classes that are full. We do do some open swim and family swims on the weekends as well. Uh, catalogs, uh, we do three catalogs a year, um, fall, winter, and spring. Fall comes out uh, in August, right before the school year starts. Winter uh, comes out um, right in December, and then spring will be coming out in April. Uh, because of COVID and some cost saving measures, they went from print uh, and mailing out to online version only. Uh, we continue to hear how important it is, uh, or people would like to have that in print and sent to them. Um, so we are looking to do that for the spring, and we are looking at some uh, advertising partners to help offset some of the costs because um, it's between about eight thousand to ten thousand uh, to print and mail those out to our 15,000 uh, homes in our, our district. And that kind of gives you the timeline there. So fall was online, winter, uh, spring was online. Um, we also, when we do the, the online, we do send out postcards uh, just to make sure people are aware that, that that's there and, and they, they understand uh, the opportunities that are, are there. Uh, community ed education outreach. Uh, we have been uh, using our Facebook page more this year. Uh, we've increased our followers there. We are also adding uh, Twitter and Instagram uh, to that, just trying to communicate out, uh, making sure that we're not just relying on uh, mailings or emails, but uh, trying to reach out to people in different ways. Uh, we also are doing newsletters uh, every two months and, and that's a, a new thing we're ever doing. We do partner with the city on the community uh, sign. And in case you received an email or two, like I did, uh, the city sign was down for about two months mm -hmm. and uh, we were working with the city to get it updated. It did get, uh, and it was a networking. Uh, they had to uh, reconnect the, the sign. We did get it reconnected on Friday. So it's, uh, it's up and running then and with new updates now. Brian, where's the newsletter available? That we, we mail out and we will be adding it to our community ed website as well. So does it get mailed out to people who registered? Or any family member uh, or any emails that we have, we will be sending it out to them. We also did send it uh, district-wide, the district emails. So maybe, it, maybe the board didn't get included in the all employee email so just that yeah, that could be we'll, we'll make sure that and be good i like yeah it. i'd like to do that okay okay I, and, and i'll uh i'll go back and resend to the board our last one okay yeah that'd be great awesome uh driver's training uh one of our more popular uh programs <laughs> obviously with our freshman and sophomore students we partner with a third party called reckless uh, driving academy um we we do about three different classes fall winter and summer which is about 30 students per class so we service 90 to 100 kids per session 
And certainly if the need is there, we'll have classes. Yes, feel free to throw in questions if you have any on any of these different programs. Do we have to go to Big Lake or does? Reckless is just out of Big Lake. Okay. Um, but all the ones that sign up and go through us are usually uh, Princeton students or residents. Uh, extended field trips, that's something that uh, we help oversee and, and with the procedures uh, with that. Um, we currently have three uh, extended trips that the, the board has approved and we're working to, to support. Uh, John Spybarker will be going to Costa Rica in the summer. That was a delay uh, from a, a COVID and it was pushed back a little bit. And then John Borsch will be going to uh, DC uh, this summer. And then John's working to go to New York next summer. Uh, currently, I oversee all our facility rentals. Um, and uh, every day I learn a little bit more about uh, the ins and outs of the facilities. It's a, it's a, probably a full-time job in just itself. We have 50% uh, of the revenue goes to fund one to help cover custodians, utilities, those type of things. 50% goes to fund four, which is community education funder to help cover our software and, and, and the costs. LEO is the program that we use and we're trying to get everybody on board and registered, including all coaches, uh, advisors, um, teachers, all those items. And since uh, July 1st, when we really uh, took out the LEO, we have had over uh, a thousand different requests and 97 different uh, accounts set. And then I, on Fridays, I will uh, email all our facility uh, rentals for the following week to all our district admin and custodians to make sure that they're on board with the plan and, and Keith and his crew uh, develop a, a schedule based on that, especially on non-student uh, days. Um, just to expand a little bit on facilities, Right now, um, obviously, we have a, a space shortage. Um, most of our high school activity programs take up most of our high school uh, gyms and spaces. Middle school takes up our, our middle school activities. We do have some ninth grade programs that also use the middle school. Um, at our intermediate building, we rent out to Just for Kicks Dance. That's where archery is based. And really, Currently, it's the only, um, and I'm talking more gym space right now, uh, it's really the only space we can uh, use for any community ed programming, such as uh, uh, we did bring back like game score and stuff uh, this year. Um, primary, uh, we have Tiger Club in there till 6 p.m. Uh, we do rent out that space after 6 p.m. So um, obviously there's uh, more requests then we can meet and we do have other groups that reach out to us uh, from nearby communities. We always serve as our community first, but um, it's, uh, it is a struggle um, it, with the, the new custodian uh, agreement. Uh, anything on the weekends is overtime. So it adds some costs to groups that are, are renting spaces. So everybody is trying to avoid those costs as best they can. So they, they want evenings, that we rent out and we have limited space and limited time. So um, it's a it's an ongoing challenge that we try to, to meet those. And, and uh, we've met uh, with our, our the admin team and with principals quite often to try to figure out logistics, especially uh, as some of those requests fill over to Saturdays and Sundays. One thing to know is that, you know, he mentioned that the intermediate school gym is one of the few spaces that is available for other uh, activities that aren't school related. Um, and But we, we also have a need to expand our Tiger Club and utilize the intermediate school for Tiger Club. And one essential piece of that is having a place for the students to go and be active for at least a period of time. I don't know, 45 minute hour, whatever. I don't know what it is, but I mean, that part of the program is they need a place to go and blow off a little steam. So right now we're a little reluctant to 
to expand our tiger club into the intermediate because if we did we'd have to dislocate some programs that have been utilizing that space for a, a quite a while now so that's just a one of those dilemmas that we have right now that we need to find a solution for so okay i just had a quick question on the uh, on the overall uh, calendar part of it is there a way to view the schedule like online or do you already have that uh, available to yeah so if you go to our website and you go to uh, facilities uh, you can uh, you can request and when you try to book you can do all whatever and you don't even have to have you don't have to be registered or so anybody can go on to you and say so i'd like to rent out the tiger gym at the high school on this date and they'll they'll show you if there's a conflict or not no oh, yeah, very nice very nice thank you so uh with ben's example you know today we had um we had games galore going from 3 30 to 4 30 um and then we had uh archery in there from 4 30 to 6 30 and then we have um this evening we have some dance going from 6 30 to 9 so uh if we and we have roughly and, and i'll have a slide on it here coming up we have roughly about 60 families on the wait list for tiger club um and that at the uh, school age we have our preschool that's right around 40 45 students and families we're serving um, we're working really hard on all our wait lists because I, I don't like to turn folks away on, on anything. So we're really trying to, and we have the staff, it's just we don't have the space. Um, and uh, obviously with our uh, increased enrollment at the primary, that limited how many classrooms we can do because we're servicing those, those students right after school and teachers need time to um, prep at the end of the day as well. So um, yeah, we're, we're trying to meet needs as best we can. We have three title rooms that we use at the primary building. We have the cafeteria and the gym. Obviously in the fall and spring, we can get outside a little bit. Um, but we have a, at the primary, at the, the school age childcare, we're a 15 to one ratio. And then at the family center, we're 10 to one. So now at the primary, there's a curtain and that can be split into two gym size. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. What, so, uh, what facility are you using for archery? Archery is intermediate unless they like for their big February tournament we have coming up. Um, then we'll go to the middle school. Do we have a relationship with Whitcomb anymore? Or? Yep. Uh, Gail and Andy run uh, run our. We ever use their facility? We did, and we moved it to the school Why community not? yet because of busing Cost. issues and um, there were some other issues that community had brought it back. Because that would free up some space if they could. They could. Uh, I think the biggest thing, and Don's correct, is from my understanding, it was trying to get people transported there that didn't have the means to get there. You know. Right now, um, for our, our tournament on February 10th and 11th, Gail just told me today that they have over 900 people registered. So it's going to be a busy weekend. It's one of the biggest tournaments in the state. Yeah. So we are fortunate that yeah. we bring in that many because normally the other tournaments we go to will not be that big. Right. Has there been any communication to the restaurant businesses or any other businesses in town? No, I just found that out. But oh. We definitely need to uh, communicate yeah. that out. And um, it's a huge opportunity. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, uh, I just uh, did get newly elected to the chamber board, so uh, I'll com communicate that out to yeah. Whether you like it or not. <laughs> I started day one and I volunteered him. So, yep. so you know, she, knew she, she knew what she was doing. Um, one item that uh, uh, Mr. Barn asked me to kind of look at was uh, facility procedures. And um, there was, a lot of, um, I'll, I'll say kind of like handshake agreements that I had to sort through uh, when I came on board. And uh, it's, we're trying to streamline that process a little bit. We, we have a very uh, solid, I think, uh, four class system for our rentals with class one being all our programs, whether it's uh, middle school, high school, what I call fun one and, and the community at fun four. Our programs are, are at no cost. Um, we have a, 
uh, class two that is um, booster uh, nonprofit groups. We have um, group a uh, class three that is our residents, and then we have class four that are non residents. Um, the biggest item is I was sorting kind of through all these things were I think our rates are very comparable to other districts, uh, with, especially within the Mississippi Conference. The the item is is that we have some groups that will rent, you know, 10, 20 hours. We have other groups that rent 200, 300 hours, and yet some groups are, are renting four or 500 hours. When we get up to those type of hours, um, the cost really adds up for some of our, our booster groups, even though they're on class two and they're technically at a 70% discount from like a class four. The, the question uh, that we have discussed as an admin group, do we do a multi-hour discount? And the example I used was, so if you get to 100 hours rented, you would do a 10% overall discount. At 200, it'd be 20%. At 300, it'd be uh, 30, 400, 40%. So I did um, run the numbers this past week. And I'll, I'll just use three groups, or three major groups. So just for kicks, uh, from October 1st to April, if they stay on, and we've had some We've had some e-learning days that have impacted some hour rentals and things like that, but they're at uh, 243 hours rented. So they would qualify for a 20% overall discount. Um, jail volleyball is at 433 hours. That would qualify for 40%. And PYBA is at 446 hours. So when you're looking at those, you know, this rough numbers, um, if it's a $10,000 rental overall bill, then you'd be looking at uh, $6,000 instead of $10,000. So we've discussed um, doing that as a, as a transition um, because, again, there was kind of unwritten rules with some of these agreements with different groups, and I'm trying to put something together that's fair and consistent for all groups. Um, and is that the best system now for this year as a, like a transition year or is that something that's fair and consistent long term as well so i did bring this to our uh, advisory council back in november to get their thoughts we have a meeting tomorrow uh, i'm curious to see what they thought of that um, and then also would appreciate any feedback from the board I think it's great that you're doing that because I've heard, you know, there's been a lot of negative feedback with the way it was going because it was like maybe even favorites uh, for some right. groups. But what you're doing is, I think, is an excellent idea. And I what it that some people yeah, do. Yeah. Back, you know, little, little deals, you know, yep. on the side kind of thing. Yep. So to, to tear it out like you're doing it, I think that's a great idea because then you can show that to people and say, well, this is. This is where you fall, and so this is how we're doing that. Okay. So I think it's great. Yeah, the consistency is going to be huge, and I think we need to have that transition year. So, you know, maybe this transition year there'll be a more of a discount, but you know, I I think we'll have to be real thoughtful about. You know, we might not be able to add that big of a discount every year. You know, maybe that transition year to help us buffer what had been versus what should have been. And then move forward, but I I do think that's a a concept that I mean we're all used to that, right? If you you buy so many of something, you get the fifth one for you get that one for free or whatever, and I think that's the concept. So well, in your policy right now, that's twenty two twenty three that you know, everyone is reviewing. Are you thinking that for twenty three twenty four there's going to be changes, and then we'll be reviewing for. Or do you see this going into 23, 24 as well, the same rate schedule? Or? Well, the, the rates have been set for a long time. We haven't adjusted any rates. Uh, as far as the facility procedures that we we went through in October, um, we've really just cleaned up language and uh, as far as procedures go, and we've reorganized that document, the 902 document. We, we didn't 
Um, our job is just to follow your policy and put procedures in to, to make sure that happens. So we didn't do any major changes. The only the only really major change to that document would be um, the multi-hour discount. And so it's it's something I, I'm just looking for feedback, obviously for this year, because um, um, kind of like Eric mentioned, and some, some groups had a, a $3,000 agreement and you can rent as many gyms as you want for as many hours and other, I'm finding out, well, it's 5,000. Other people were saying, well, we didn't have to do this or that. Um, and the other piece with it is, again, the custodian overtime on the weekends, that really plays a lot into it because you're adding $30, $40 an hour to every tournament or whatever. Correct. So that's why I'm wondering, you know, if you're reviewing it yearly so that we make sure that we are breaking even. Right. So. Right. Absolutely. Um, and I, I think if, like Ben mentioned, if, if we move forward with it this year as a transition and make sure everybody's on the same page, and then we can meet and see how, how big of an impact it had on not only our fund one budget, but our fund four, and did we cover all our costs, and were we fair and reasonable to our groups? And then if it's something that we want to continue, maybe it's maybe it's not at this vast of a dis, you know, discount, but we can modify and adjust it from there. Kind of what I was just going to ask if that was something that we could say, like to make clear, this is a transition year. This is what we're doing to try and get everybody on the same page. And then next year, you know, you might not get a 40% discount. You know, we're going to have to, we can look at the numbers and go back to it, I guess. Right. And, and I think what we ran into is, um, you know, even though our, our rates haven't changed and they've been posted and they are what they are, um, Again, these agreements were past practice, and you know, it's always past practice. And so then registration fees were based on that. And so, um, you know, what I kept on hearing from groups is saying that, well, we have to raise our registration rates, or we already did, we took our registration already. We can't change the rates. Can we can we do something? So I think this uh really solves a lot of those issues, and then we can make a decision moving forward if it works or do we modify it. Would you be giving a, a multi-hour discount to just the nonprofit groups or are we talking for-profit groups? Because you did mention um, the dance, just for the dance. It, what I was looking at, any group that got you 100 hours or more time, because really less than 100 hours, I feel like it's, it's not, I mean, it is, um, can be a lot of money to some groups, but it really doesn't add up until you start seeing those. And I, I haven't heard from any groups that have rented just a day or a couple days. We've had churches that have rented out yeah. a day. Um, and that's not really where you get concern. It's where you get those hours and hours and hours built up. Who came up with the, even though they're not set in stone, like the 10, 20, 10%, 20%, 20%, percent I had reached out to other directors in the area that were, um, that had some sort of multi-hour discounts. And- uh, Is that high? I mean, that, um, I mean, nobody was that high, but to try to get to where we were know. trying to, <laughs> where we were trying to be consistent with what we had charged our groups and the discount we had, given above that class two, we kind of had to go that high because there was a lot of a lot of special agreement. And and when it gets passed, all of you have been on boards before, when you when you've uh, passed it on to different boards and different presidents, and it's that was the biggest thing I've I've kind of covered is some of these agreements were 10, 15 years ago. Well our utilities uh, had changed a lot in the last 10, 15 years. Custodian costs have changed a lot in 10, 15 years. So we haven't done a great job keeping up to the district's top. I, I think it's safe to say that the, that the discount for the buffer year will be more than what it will be ongoing. And then that we just need to communicate so that they'll be able to realize that. I mean, these are big operations, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. I think the There's a lot of money being exchanged in terms of participation fees and, mm -hmm. yeah. 
Well, again, it's it's an ongoing discussion. Um, we 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 have not told any groups that what these are. We're just telling the groups that we're working on them all day hour as well. So we haven't communicated anything. So I appreciate any feedback or thoughts on on this, not only for this year but moving forward. Um, well, we so a hundred hours is ten percent. Two hundred hours is twenty percent. So this, it's a thousand this, hours. We we did a max of five hundred. <laughs> we, uh, we did a max of five hundred plus is what we we said. Okay. So we were the max discount would be fifty percent. Okay, that's what I want. Yeah. I would just like to say I think that that's a great idea for the transition year as long as we communicate that. This, you know, we know all the other agreements that happened. We're trying to standardize it. This is right. this year and then going forward. So that way it gives them a chance to adjust and raise their yes. registration or whatnot, but that they're not, you know, whoa, this isn't what you said last year, you right. know. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The last uh, item with facilities is the, uh, the waiver process. Um, went to a conference this summer, um, and it was uh, a law conference, and uh, law and facilities go hand in hand in a lot of areas, and the biggest uh, concern that uh, the uh, attorney that I listened to was about our waiver process, and it was surrounding a lot of open gyms and captain's practices. Um, we haven't had um, a great waiver system, and it, and and making sure that not only do we cover the district, but also staff that are supervising uh, those events and making sure that we have an appropriate supervisor there. Um, it's, uh, as a former activities director, I know it's hard to uh, staff those because you can't have a, a coach 10th through 12th grade. And so uh, can you get a middle school or ninth grade or a parent there that's consistent and can Look, raise and lower hoops or set out volleyball equipment. It's just, it's a difficult process. And so um, we're working with our coaches on, on setting something up um, and being consistent and fair across the board uh, with that. Um, we, the biggest thing right now is we have a waiver system in place. Um, and the other thing we're doing is as an open, as, as a community ed program, we're offering open gyms now and we're staffing that ourselves. So every single non-student day like yesterday we're staffing open gyms uh, for two hours and we're going to continue to do that and we're going to do some things in the summer uh, to give uh, all students an opportunity to get in and we're charging five dollars uh, for that to kind of offset that a little bit um, the biggest piece that i've talked to coaches about is if we have if we have our booster or class two rent out gyms it's a lot more um, cost effect effective for them because they can rent out a gym for twenty or thirty dollars, and then they can staff it appropriately, and and they can have forty kids in there for for twenty dollars. So we're working through that. The biggest piece for myself and our district, I think, is just making sure that we have supervision in there, uh, appropriate supervision, and uh, make sure kids are safe. So when we talk about captain's practice early in the morning and they can't get a coach in there or coach can't be in there. So a parent does it. What's the liability to the district or to that parent if there's an issue during that practice, if there's an injury or if there's, because I, I did it for baseball uh, last year and I was just kind of making it. What, What's my liabilities or, or any parent that's it, actually supposed to be there to supervise? Yeah, it, it is a big liability it's for the district, especially if that individual doesn't have a background check. Um, so that's the biggest thing I've been communicating to mm -hmm. all our, our coaches and advisors of our activity program is that whoever, whatever adult is there has to go through the district um, background check. And um, it's it's a ten dollar fee, and so either the the volunteer does pays for it, or maybe the booster club covers that cost. But we have to have that in at the very minimum to cover the district. Um, and then if it's a, and then if we are doing the waiver process, even for captain's practice, 
that can clear the district and that individual that's with you. But we Who's really beat that with the kids, uh, kids the and the parent, and it is a Google form that we can just send. Okay. So that's really the two pieces that we're trying to put into place is making sure we have a background check for every adult in those areas and making sure we have a waiver filled out. So two things. So if they, if they sign the waiver and the child gets hurt, they're not going to go on. That will not affect our insurance then is what you're saying? Correct. And, okay. and Michelle can speak to that uh, a uh, little bit more. They're not covered on our insurance. Correct. Well, okay. districts as a whole. If they get hurt. Yeah, because it would be a never ending. Okay. And then my second comment is the update on open gym, which I think is wonderful because if you're just, if it's a league or captains, you're just getting those kids in. But with a whole open gym, that could reach everyone who doesn't get that opportunity. So yeah, I I, I, uh, I covered a couple over winter break uh, and it was really fun to see uh, the mom come in and play catch with the son with baseball. And it was really cool to see uh, Ninth grade basketball players working with fourth graders and uh, teaching them how to shoot layups. It was it was a really rewarding experience, and it was just across the board. Um, currently, we've been doing most of those at the middle school because you can really drop all curtains and really have three different activities going on. Uh, but we're hoping to uh, grow those out. Currently, we've been emailing staff on those open gyms, all our coaches, and then our 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 blue groups, uh, just letting them know. Okay. I just I just had a quick question on the um on the background checks. So who tracks that as far as it, is it the coach's responsibility or we uh community ed has been taking that on um Bro, and oh, so oh, and we keep a, a running list along with uh Jason Sunny's help uh keeping an updated list. That, I knew that one was gonna take a long time, but facilities always does. Uh, any other items with facilities? Uh, Tiger Club, we spoke to this a little bit. Uh, again, we have our um, our student age care, uh, K through five, we do before uh, school and uh, after school. Um, that's 6 a.m. we start that till uh, the school day starts and then we go right after the school day to uh, to 6 p.m. We, uh, we are looking at maybe expanding that to the intermediate building, uh, depending on uh, numbers and requests, and we're going to start uh, um, doing our our summer enrollment in March here, and that will kind of give us a clue on what to expect for for next year. Obviously, with uh, enrollment up, I expect our request to be up. Our and then our preschool is uh, ages three to, to the kindergarten enrollment, um, and we also do the summer uh, and non school day child care. And we do a lot of different fun activities, uh, field trips, those type of things with Tiger Club. Here's a, a few of our uh, data that we have. Uh, last summer, we had over 200 students. Uh, that's carried over to uh, the, the school year with almost 200 in, uh, at the primary and 43 uh, on the wait list. And in preschool, we have 47 um, currently. One thing that uh, um, Ben and I have been working on quite a bit is um, right now our, our procedure with Tire Club is that when we have a e-learning day or a closure day, Tire Club has been closing. And I, I struggle with it and I know Ben struggles with it when he has to make that call because we know that we have uh, school age kiddos probably staying home alone because parents have to go to work. and so. On our last uh, e-learning day, which was the fifth, we did uh, we had surveyed staff and to see who could come in and work, even if uh, school would close. We were able to get staffing put together, and we had um, 23 families here at the family center, and we had 44 at the primary. So we had almost 70 families uh, take that up. So you can you know there's a need, um, and so we're working with our staff on trying to. To develop a plan to be able to stay open and service those families even when the when, when school is closed. And so though, were there additional families that then normally do Tiger Club that can opt for those days or are those 
All Tiger Club families. Those are all Tiger Club families. Okay. Um, we do have a, a drop-in rate where if they're not consistently coming, they can come just for a day. Um, and we did have a few of those families take us up. One idea we had was for next year so we can have, because um, it's a commitment on the staff part and they don't want to come in, we have um, we have a procedure. As soon as we get down to our ratio, we send staff home. Well, we don't want to bring staff in on those days and send them home after 90 minutes or something. So we have to kind of commit to a four or six hour block and we don't want to lose money on the situation. So we're, we're trying to figure out what, how best to make that happen. I guess I was just going to ask about the staffing. So that was for this last one. It was just like whoever was volunteered and could come in, kind of just Googled up. Yeah, uh, all our Tiger Club staff is at will employees. So they, they're they not um, on a contract. They're not getting paid um, if they're not. And so we we gave them a, an option. Um, and we, we covered it some with myself and Kayla helping out and with the transitions, but uh, we were able to make it work and with the staff that, that could come in. All right. Um, Kayla is, is in charge of a lot. She's in charge of the adult. Uh, she's in charge of the uh, entire club and youth rec. Um, and uh, doing it again with a new director and a new coordinator. It's uh, a lot of things up in the air juggling right now. Um, obviously, I think our youth rec enrichment is probably what we are known best. Uh, it's probably our, some of our most popular programs. I think when people think of community ed, they think of these things, but obviously we have uh, a lot of things that we cover um, and, and this is uh, things that we are now putting out requests for our, our summer uh, because uh, our, our the different programs we'll be running are due to us in February, so we can put it together in March and send the catalog out in April. So working on our summer programs now Here's some of our numbers. Uh, last summer, we had over 1,800 participants uh, in our, our rec and enrichment programs. We uh, had over 1,000 in the fall. And then uh, winter and spring drop off quite a bit just because there's so many different offerings. But those are some of the things that uh, we focused on and do. So that's community ed uh, side. I won't take as long with the family center, but uh, it's uh, it is a uh, another very important piece to my day. Um, we oversee uh, all our preschool. Uh, that's a little picture of our our staff and students from homecoming this past year. Mm -hmm. And the biggest thing I, I preach to our our kids and our staff is that we're setting a, a solid foundation to a rock solid education. And and uh, the one thing that we're looking at doing. Uh, and I, I was, uh, I, I'm married to a longtime kindergarten teacher, and uh, she, she always, you know, it's like, well, it's, it's funny because we have kids coming to kindergarten that aren't ready, always ready for kindergarten. And when I got in this role, we're only currently servicing 20 students in all day, every day preschool. Mm -hmm. um, so when you think of a, a class of 225, or less than 10%. And so that's one area that we're looking at growing, uh, that all day everyday program, get more kids in to, to preschool so that we can get them ready as they, they make that transition. So and, that's- And the reason we don't have more isn't that families don't want to have that service, is that we don't have any more classrooms in this building to offer that. So that is uh, a, more, an issue that's been more recently uncovered that we need to come up with a solution and long range planning committee I think is going to be responsible for taking a look at what we can lease potentially and then what are our long term solutions for possible building but you had mentioned to me like how many you think you could fill a class like tomorrow if we had this the, another classroom right if we if we offered another all day every day i'm pretty sure we'd fill it um by the end of this week so there that's our, our waiting lists are for all day every day preschool it's for tiger club and aquatics so those are the three things and gymnastics too i guess where we have a, a long waiting, waiting list those in those programs uh the family center our early childhood is made up 
uh, for community ed, ed office staff. We have 14 teachers. We have seven classrooms. We use a cold teaching model, which is general ed as well as a special ed teacher. Um, and we service uh, tier one and tier two in that way. We do have, uh, we did add a tier three. We do service tier three students uh, that are um, in a special ed setting only. And then we work to get them in back into tier two, eventually tier one. And the goal is that hopefully by the time they get to kindergarten, they can function in a general ed setting. Um, we do have 2.5 staff members that are part C. Part C, if you're not familiar with that, is we connect with families from birth to three, and we reach out and we currently are, are servicing over 50 different families in that Part C where we try to make connection to them early on. We have 13 paraprofessionals, uh, 11 support staff that we that uh, I oversee in our building, which includes speech, tape, reading court. Uh, some remember work co-ops, and we have a county staff member. We have two custodians, two nursing staff, and then we have eight Tigers Club staff just at the Family Center, and then we have um, up to 30 different Tigers Club staff members at the, at the primary building. Um, we, we focus on instructional goals, uh, just like every other building, and uh, we did meet our math and reading goals last year, and uh, we uh, are up in that 90 percentile. So um, we're, we're increasing that and, and trying to uh, continue to push the envelope with 93% uh, in our math goal and 96% in our reading goal. And then obviously our goal is to try to get as many students ready for kindergarten uh, with the world's best workforce. And uh, with that, that would be one of the reasons why we would try to increase our all day every day preschool. Uh, this is hard to read. I apologize. Uh, this is a part of our curriculum mapping. Uh, we uh, met at the admin team and talked about this quite a bit today. And it's something that we're really focused on uh, our course descriptions, our, our scope and sequence, and then identifying standards. Really important at the preschool level uh, with the habits of the tiger and our social and emotional learning. Uh, again, especially coming out of the pandemic, trying to make sure kids are able to function at a high level with other peers in the classroom, not only at the preschool level, but as they go into uh, kindergarten as well. We are partnering with uh, Sarah Markhausen right now for uh, our kindergarten safari that we'll be uh, doing again in, in March. Uh, and we offer um, not only summer, but spring classes to help those students get ready for kindergarten with some different programming. Uh, and our ECFE uh, Advisory Council helps and supports with that as well. Stephanie Minendorf, uh, who did her presentation back in December about the World's Best Workforce, she kind of helps oversee some of these programs um, with our uh, school readiness, our screening, and helps oversee our EC uh, FE Advisory Council as well. Uh, just some numbers with our, our hand in hand preschool. We, uh, we service three through five-year-olds. We have one to five day uh, options and then half or full day. Uh, we currently have 210 uh, students in preschool, seven classrooms, like I mentioned before. Uh, we have about 20 students on that uh, waiting list um, that we are hoping to get off that waiting list. And uh, again, with the addition of another tier three, level three class, that was our only classroom that we had open. So um, we've thrown out a lot of ideas around, do we move Tiger Club somewhere else? Do we do we move tier three somewhere else? Um, but with with parent drop off and busing and, and vans, it's, it's a complicated process. Um, screening, uh, every child has to be screened before they get to kindergarten. Uh, we have, really done a nice job uh, upping that communication. And uh, two years ago, we were at 164 prior to them getting to the primary building and then we're screening and catching them up there where uh, this past year we've gotten to 236. Um, that's that's a good thing, but it's also can be a challenging thing because of the more you screen, especially um, after the pandemic. Pre-pandemic, we were um, getting, about 100 special ed evals um, 
and then we're about 30 or 40 we're qualifying for special ed services. Um, this year alone, we're on pace to do over 200 evals, special ed evals, and over 100 um, are qualifying for special ed services. Um, and, and like I mentioned, we have over 50 on our Part C that are, are looking like they're going to qualify for special ed. So uh, special ed is on the rise. That's why we added the Tier 3. Um, we've had to add a para uh, or two paras now uh, because of that. Um, and it's something that I am uh, continuing to discuss with Steve Milam, um, our special ed uh, director, as well as all our, our building admin, because they have to be aware and, and plan for what's what's coming their way. And uh, it's going to impact classrooms. So we're trying to do the best to service the students and the families so we can help them uh, get caught up and get on track. When they qualify at the preschool age, does that follow them into the school or do they get reevaluated again? In, in the IEP does follow them um, and uh, they, they they constantly are on the IEP uh, re eval. And so okay. IEPs can change, but we, uh, it we does just follow them yeah, into the part of, We just, I was on an IEP uh, last week with a foster student, and the foster student was only going to be in our district for about another week. But you still go through it because that will follow them wherever. But that's a good thing that it follows them Absolutely. and reevaluates, yeah. right? So yeah. they don't have to requalify. Exactly. And, just and it gets them the support and help they need, and then mm -hmm. um, and then the follow-up IEPs mm -hmm. modify and adjust things. So when you talk about the part three for three-year-olds and service that you what exactly is that? Is that for the parents too, or is that it, 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 obviously? Um, it, it involves home visits and helping them with structures and routines at home that can support the child be to be successful as they make that transition. Usually, as a three-year-old to a, a special ed uh, setting, whether it's tier two or tier three in our building. So they come to us for help, or are we seeking them out? Or this through it's county? usually it's county. usually through a county or the hospital uh, uh, reaching out saying that uh, we have a, a family that needs your services. Does the family have have a child? That they, I don't want the service then, or how do they? They do. I mean, the parents are a part of the IEP uh, process, and we do have families that decline it. Um, and uh, and we have to before we go through the eval process, we have to have uh, written permission to do that. It's caused a significant challenge staffing wise. Um, we've had to hire several paras, and it will be an ongoing issue that we'll be faced with. Does that include home visits then too? Yeah, yeah, we have. Uh, <laughs> Two and a half staff members that are pretty much um, their most of their day is doing home visits and, and follow up uh, evals. Now, how, is, how hard is it to gain the trust of, of parents um, for the for these people that are going into people's homes under these types of stressful situations? Um, I, I would say that it's a big part of their job is relationship and trust building. Um, uh, the home visits that I've uh, attended as well, it's for those families, it's they're looking for resources and support most of the time. And, and it's more and any support that we can give them. Usually it's very welcome. The one struggle we do have from time to time is that not sometimes not both parents are on the same page. And so we have to communicate and educate um, both parents. And sometimes they're not in the same household. And they're probably a little bit more at ease with with you versus somebody from the county. So you because you're not an enforcement type. Exactly. You know. We make it very well known that we're here to educate and support. Um and and it's not a judgment thing. So with all these IEPs. Um, that affects our preschool numbers because they get free enrollment into preschool as part of their and transportation. So that can offset people who are wanting to come in as well because do they take priority over a regular family? Yeah, so our 
our tier one is currently set up that it's it's nobody on uh, IEPs. Our tier two is uh, our part days or half days and and days from one to four. Um, and we we have it set up that if it's a class of twenty, it can have up to ten IEPs and then ten general students. And so we hold spots for both. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's certainly. Um, it's a balancing act for sure. In these like hundred that are qualifying, do you know the difference between learning um, deficit and behavior? Is there one more than the other? Um, it's a combination. Um, and, and some of the IPs, it, it might be services and it might be, right. it might be one 20 minute session a week okay. um, where some are learning and behavior and they're part of our our level three uh, class and and for those of you that maybe are on the, uh, the level three is with a one-on-one -on -one para um, where a, a level two it might be uh, the general teacher special ed teacher in one para so there's three staff members that we could usually have 30 uh, students in there but we put 20 in there with the three staff members because half of them are on um, either, and, and most of those are probably uh, IEPs that are LD more than behavior. Um, our ECFE, uh, along with our Part C, we have a uh, Tiffany and Amy do a great job connecting families uh, into uh, our setting and working with, and, and this is preschool with a parent connection. And so, uh, and some of these classes are offered in the during the day as well as in the evening. So like tonight, they have a, a Tuesday night class going on right now. And some of those classes are uh, not separating. They're together the entire time. And we're supporting the student while the parent is there and, and helps. Uh, and then some of them are, uh, they're, they're together initially for about a half hour and then they separate for a certain amount of time. So uh, goals moving ahead, uh, obviously we wanna be uh, financially responsible. We want to uh, con continue to assess needs and desires of our community, not only at the preschool level uh, and tire club level, but all our rec and enrichment programs. We wanna continue to market and, and grow our programs. We wanna continue to coordinate and collaborate. Um, again, my background, uh, I was a teacher for about 20 years and I've been, uh, uh, in the activities world for the last four and uh, brand new in the community world, community ed world. But um, I work with every single building with every single principal uh, on a day to day operation. And it's, it's a very unique position. Um, and we're looking to uh, continue to improve and wherever we can. So, any other questions? I think it's based on what you just said that we have really reinforces that that uh, we made a really good hire. Um, you have everything that we need right now. <laughs> we appreciate all your hard work. Pleased but not satisfied. We're you know we're we're happy with some of the progress <laughs> that we've made, but this is what we're not satisfied, and we're constantly going to improve. Right. That's the goal. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you. So much. Much. Great job. Mm -hmm. We'll move on to uh, number five, there are no citizens comments. And number six, to reports, board member committee reports. And we'll start with John. Okay, I had um, all see tonight. Last week I attended the MSBA leadership conference. And then over the weekend, um, had a fun time seeing the variety show at the high school and then also the VEX IT tournament was at home. So, a lot of good learning happening. Yeah. yeah, I went to the MSBA Thursday, Friday, and um, an agenda, agenda planning. Um, and one thing I wanted to add about uh, the Ulsa Hansen, the second speaker that we saw, she actually, as everybody was sitting there, she, she really had a real ac academia mm -hmm. presentation. She has a uh, podcast that's the, the Future of Smart. There's about 12 to 15 uh, episodes. 
Um, I won't, I'm only listening to a couple so far. I've heard the trying to go in more detail than what her presentation was. Because I feel like she was really, she didn't have enough time no, within that 45 to three minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so I highly recommend it's called The Future of Smart, is the name of the podcast. But definitely worth, uh, worth listening. That's all I have. I um, also attended the um, MSBA conference and had a good time there. Um, I thought the conference was excellent, and my very best part was the keynote speaker. So yes. the other very first one was just he was just amazing. And um, I also uh, attended yesterday um, the staff development session for oh. teachers in the morning. Um, I was able to hear Mick uh, do his blog. Um, presentation, and then I, I stayed for about half of the um, diversity um, awareness training. Um, so it's like both of them, super good. Um, I'm sure that guy was just, the diversity training was amazing. So, um, so that was good. Eric. Policy. And then? Um, I attended phase two uh, training with Melissa um, the day before the conference started, and then Thursday and Friday was the school board conference. Melissa? Um, obviously, phase two training and then the conference. Um, and then I also just wanted to share two things from the conference that were in, I know we had some awesome speakers, but Two of the things I thought that related so much to just what we've been working on at the career academies um, was that Minnesota is ninth overall in the nation with student loan debt. And also only 22% of jobs in Minnesota require college education before you can start. So I just thought that was, that just kind of blew my mind that we were ninth in college debt. That's yeah, they said we sent 60% of our students to college, to four-year colleges, and there's only 22% of that jobs that require a four-year college. And a lot of those, if they had a certificate or something, then they would have been able to get paid for further training college, whatever they needed. It was just mind-blowing to, you know, just reiterate how important it is that we have this academy going. Um, and then I went to a ninth grade basketball game, which was super fun. One of the boys' games, and um, we went and saw the variety show. And you can't go wrong. Thank you. Uh, there is now a student council report, and we'll move on to uh, superintendent report. Okay, so right before the uh, board meeting or policy committee, I had an opportunity to speak with a representative. I think of the assistant commissioner of education regarding um, the five e-learning days in statute uh, due to inclement weather. I referenced that at our last board meeting. And uh, we've uncovered that uh, because we are a, a district that has a state approved online program that we do have some additional flexibility uh, for e-learning days more than the five that are specifically shared in statute due to inclement weather. Um, so that's something that you know we're going to explore some more. There is a, there is some uh, small nuances to that. That if we were to choose to um, make any additional <clears throat> inclement weather days an e-learning day, uh, more than the five, and, and put it under that umbrella of us being a state approved program, we would have to offer the option. For a family to bring their child in to school uh, if they didn't want their child to participate in the e-learning day, which you know I need to think that through a little bit more. I'm just kind of talking the gates the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean the the alternative, you know, if we didn't want to pursue that, I mean it would be it would be a interesting thing to think through, but uh, we want do it that way and we would just simply make up additional days and uh you know that would be something that if i i'm going to work to learn more about it and then i'll i'll want to get some um feeling from the board on what direction you you'd prefer us to pursue 
<clears throat> quite honestly, any decision you'd make there, some people will like it and some people won't like it. I mean, we can think, yeah, let's add these. Well, we know there'll be plenty of people not happy that we're adding days for one and, and for two, they'll be unhappy with which day we choose to add the days, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm just sharing with you, this is an option. Um, you know, we'd have to work out, again, the nuances associated with that if, if we chose to pursue that. Yeah. We're still, you know, under our five anyhow, but I guess I'm going to be a realist and know that. <laughs> I mean, even this morning, the alarm, we were up at four in the morning because we were worried about the icy roads. You know, thankfully, that little bit of snow that we got that covered um, that helped us have school today. If we wouldn't have had that, um, we might have had school on Monday. Oh, well, that was there. <laughs> yeah. That yeah. Was because, it, and we had a staff development day on Monday, and uh, I mean, people were coming in to that, that auditorium, white knuckled man, and some of them were freaked out well from the drive and just like getting across the parking lot that parking lot was it was terrible yeah. oh my gosh that yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, i want the board to know that uh i did have an opportunity uh to speak uh with board chair uh, at msba regarding our uh, getting our board goals out in front of us again um, we haven't review, re reviewed those for about a year. Um, so I'm going to be sending an email uh, with what those board goals were so that you can get your head around that and be thinking about um, some ideas so that at our next school board meeting, we can start discussing um, you know, how we would like to frame that in terms of having a board goal or board goals. Um, in, and then with the idea that having some discussion at the first February meeting and depending on our progress, uh, hopefully finalizing some things at that second board meeting in February. Um, also had the opportunity in that same conversation to talk about the superintendent evaluation and I will be sending the board, um, you know, what that looks like so that you can start getting your head wrapped around what things to be looking for and thinking about. And uh, we can talk about any education that you'd like to have as it relates to some of the topic areas on there. If you feel like you don't have enough information, you know, we have between now and the end of June to help, uh, help you, you know, understand what are the things that I'm doing as it relates to that criteria area. So just wanted to make that reference. A lot of things happening right now with facilities. I, I do think that I'm gonna to have to get the, the new group that's on the long range planning committee together uh, here sooner than later. Um, so please be looking for a communication on that. Um, we had uh, a meeting today with architects and engineers on the parking lot uh, reconfiguration at the high school. I do want that language planning to be able to, you know, review that, ask questions before we move forward and take that out to bid. Um, quite honestly, it's it, it's frustrating because any there's no perfect answer, right? You know, so it's like you, you you we're trying to come up with the best solution that we can, but it's really trying to separate the parent drop off from the students and make things as safe as possible. But to do that, you know, you're really taking some, you know, certain ways that you come in, you know, enter entrances and exits and, you know, will impact the traffic flow in the city at different times of the day. It the traffic flow is already impacted, you know, now, and it always has been, but it will just be a different, you know, if you ask people to come in a different entrance point and it's only a one way in, there'll be a certain level of training and things that will take time to get people used to that. Uh, we, we referenced our need for space for early childhood programming. Uh, we have spoken to uh, a local church that does have some space potentially for lease. Then that is on the agenda. Okay, all right, then I'll wait for that. Uh, we have some developments on the weight room. Um, 
that's probably on the agenda as well. So I'll wait on that. Um, how about to just wait on all of that stuff related to facilities because we're going to talk about it. I'm excited tomorrow. I uh, I'm get to meet with the middle, the newly uh, created middle school student superintendent advisory board. Oh. <laughs> um, I have been doing that with the high school. We've been talking about should I be meeting with middle school students. So tomorrow we'll be doing that over lunch, and then coincidentally uh, that next day. On Thursday, no, next tomorrow's Wednesday. Thursday, I'll do what my next meeting with the high school, um, and then with our with our team members, we're continuing on with the soup with the soup as well. So with that, let me end my remarks. Unless you had any further questions for me. All right. Thank, um, you. thank you, Ben. We'll move on to number seven. I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Welcome made by Chad. Is there a second? Second. Second made by Don. Is there any discussion? Hearing that, all in favor say aye. 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 Both same sign. We'll move on to discuss and act on previous board meeting minutes of 110, the regular meeting and the organizational meeting. I'll entertain a motion to approve those minutes. So moved. Motion made by Deb. Is there a second? Aye. Second by Chad. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. I will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. So move. Motion made by Deb. Is there a second? Second. Second by Melissa. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. We'll move on to the information section and um, looks like it's a lot in the show. It's that time of year. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the things that we do here in Princeton is we look at our parameters for next year's budget and uh, next month we would have the board set um, basically where we think enrollment is going to land. Um, what we're going to use for initial state percent and uh, negotiations we would not do here in open board meeting that we would need to close the board meeting for but um, just want to make you aware that that's that parameter will also need to be set so we're going to start with enrollment um, we had a nice surprise opening this year um, we plan for 3,000 70 students, K-12. Um, we open with 32.72, but our October 1 report, what is the 32.78? Um, at the end of November, and I thought she had the end of December done, um, which it hadn't changed much, by the way. So the 32.50 is pretty good. We, we did go down. Um, 20 students, I did look at that and how that impacts the projections. It had neg negligible impact over the projections. So I didn't revise any of that from um, the finance committee that in December. So this is a spreadsheet that Emily keeps up every month. And, you know, as long as everything looks reasonable, Michelle and Ben don't get too excited, but let's say at the end of January, we saw a 30 kid drop um, on top of the 20, we might say, okay, something's going on, we better check that out. So, um, but typically we don't see those things. Um, we do see though, from the beginning to the end of the year, we have a typical, you know, on average 50 student drop, part of that has to do with um, our um, college kids, uh, college and that go, what do they call them? PSEO, PSEO. And um, we have some kids at early grad. And of course, there's some kids that choose not to stay in school, so they drop out. Um, so by the end of the year, there's there's some kind of impact. There's moving, um, parents move, uh, decide to change schools, all that impacts us by the end of the year. 
Uh, typically, though, K-8, we're pretty solid. Uh, it's more so in that high school level that we see those drops. So if you go to uh, the multi-year analysis census for K, Emily and I thought we should put this together because um, it really starts to tell a story. When you see that in 2021, our census was 313 students. Mm -hmm. And for 23-24, we've got a census of 276. So for many years, we were um, targeting over 300 kids coming in in our resident district. And um, we're now under that um, by about 25 students. Uh, 22, 23, that was 269. So on average, Prior to this, we had done an enrollment study. We were bringing in between 70, 72% of our, our kindergartners. And so we also ran around the percent enrolled is um, of our actual residents, percent of our residents. We did a much better job in 22, 23 for this current year. We were at 70.75%. 70. I should make my screen bigger. Um, and in 21-22, we were at 73.67. Uh, the prior year, we were at 63, but our open enroll that year was bigger. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, we have put in our open enrolled uh, kindergartners that came in that year for each of those years. Um, so just looking at the average of what could happen there, um, we're looking at 220 kids for next year if we hit that average mark. Um, if you look at where we were at the lowest, meaning the lowest for um, percent of residents enrolled, so that's at 64% basically, and uh, our lowest open enrolled was 15. We could be as low as 191. But then we could be as high as 243. Um, with, you know, taking 75% of resident kids. And if we brought in open enrolled kids of around 36 students, and then the average of all those possibles is 218 kiddos. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of the ranges of our K, mm -hmm. of what, what the possibility is. Yeah. I'm excited to see the percentage. I'm, I'm hoping 24 stays at that 75% range and goes higher. Because it would be really nice to keep our kids here. Mm -hmm. So that is one number we will be, be um, making a decision on is where's kindergarten going to land. Um, I'm in that 220 to 225 range in my head thought process. Um, you know, we're at 225 this year. So I think it's possible that we will be at that next year. Sarah and Brian are going to do an awesome job with kindergarten and severity. Mm -hmm. When is that, Brian? It is uh, in March, on March, uh, March 30th. That's a little ways away. Okay. All right. The next sheet is where I look at um, the grade analysis in a different, um, a whole bunch of different ways. And I don't show that. I, I just give you the numbers um, because it would be a lot of worksheets that I would end up attaching. Uh, I was asked what the Excel is. Uh, it's actually an old, it's the old school finance. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we are no longer buying that. I'm using the previous um, stuff that we had bought and updating it myself. So, um, but for a revised enrollment, um, we, we got a few numbers here. We, we've got the Excel sheet is telling me we'll be at about 32.16. Then I do a September uh, to year-end average for each of the buildings. Um, 
that's suggesting we could be as low as 3193. Um, and then I do an average of the grade analysis uh, of each of the grades. And that one has 3214 in the for the average. Uh, there's always a low, of course, and that's 3188. And then if you are at the high, you're looking at 3237. So our average of all of those is 3215. Um, so basically we we've got some we got some low ones, we got one that's high, and we got three that are rolling in at that around that 3215. So I'm that that is what I will be using for the revised budget. That it isn't anything that you guys are really gonna vote on. It's you know, we look at that average and I report to you it's the next year, the 23-24 year. Mm -hmm. um, again, we run the school finance old sheet, which is now called Excel, and we just run it as is, and it's showing us at 32.39. Um, if I alter it, and that means taking us where we are right now with that, with uh, where we are with each grade level and moving them forward um, in the pattern that they would would roll forward. So if we have 225 in K, we're going to expect 225 in grade one. Um, if you ask Sarah though, that didn't work out from last year to this year, we got way more in first grade. <laughs> we like that. Um, but altering it, it drops our enrollment to 3177. Uh, and then again, I did the grade analysis um, looking at, at each of the years um, and the average there is also 3177 on the average uh, for the low, you know, that's really low, you know, 3100 if we have a bad year. And then if we have a high year, we hit all the high marks, it's 3259. So that that's basically looking at the growth of, you know, so if fourth grade high was 10 students, that's what I used for that high number. If it was an average of eight, that's what that number was. Um, if the low number was five, that's, you know, so some of those those grades, they drop. Uh, some of them grow. Um, we had nice, nice growth coming into this year, which makes it a little more challenging because you can't, we did not have growth significantly in kindergarten. We had system growth. Mm -hmm. So K-8 grew 135 kids. To me, that suggests families moved into our district. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing. What I don't know is, will we have that kind of move in next year? Um, and then I wrote down here uh, what the grade, what um, K is in each of these. And of course, I followed you know, <laughs> the high the low and whatnot. So using 3215 for um, our base in 23, if you look at the average, we would, would drop from 23 to 24, about 37 kids. Um, if you use the low, we'd all panic at 114. Uh, we have a high. Of 45. I won't say that's not conceivable that that could happen. Um, the previous year, last year, 22, we grew by 50. Mm -hmm. And again, that was not because necessarily of kindergarten, that was system wide. So it's the growth in our um, homes and families moving in or choosing to stay in our school district. Um, don't know which. And then um, looking at the Excel altered. Um, that would also be about a negative 38. Um, so I, I can tell you that we're we're not going to suggest that we're dropping 114 kids. I don't think that's reasonable. We are coming up though over with two negatives that are 37, 38. So, you know, around that 35 mark. And then we have one where it's possible we would go by 45. So, so we could go up, we could go down. Right, or we could stay even. We could be somewhere in between. And I, like I said, um, my first year here, we did drop 100 
than some kids. So yeah. I really don't want to <laughs> say that that can't happen. But <laughs> um, I think you know our philosophy moderately conservative. You know, but I, you know, but we need to be realist. Yeah. Uh, somewhere in the middle with all of this, mm -hmm. with the idea <clears throat> that. I hate to say it this way, but they are kind of soft parameters because we're going to be making those these parameters in what next month? Next month in February. Well, then all of a sudden in March we're doing kindergarten safari, and we might find out we we have a lot more students. Well, then we're gonna we we, we can kind of you know it's just a matter of plugging different numbers into all of these different spreadsheets, but we have to start somewhere and then we can change as we go in. and obviously we're going to know more about what the the legislature is considering yes and so any questions on enrollment this might be a, i have one question when is this like when does this have to be turned in Right. Weeks. Typically, we make the parameters on the next board meeting. Okay. Um, for the January. next year. For the next year. Got it. But the board doesn't officially adopt the, the budget. budget until June. So when Ben indicated it's soft, we may be seeing changes along the way. So it, if there's a huge kindergarten safari, the numbers could be adjusted. All of these things. I mean, and, and then even the negotiations piece, we might have a better idea. And and even once the board, this is this is why we do a revised budget in March, is that the pretty much within a couple of weeks after the board adopted a budget in June, uh, it wasn't necessarily 100% accurate because we at we decided and, and we we always run this by the board but we had to hire another kindergarten teacher because we had 20 I, I, for whatever reason the last several years we've had like anywhere between 20 and 40 families register their children for kindergarten like in august and so that throws everything. <laughs> well, we also oh. found out most of those 135 kids were coming after July 1 also. Well, yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we didn't have that that significant growth. You don't see that very often. So I was just wondering, because we have so much development going up and how many, who knows how many families will move in, in that area until we're deciding in February and then. Yeah, so kind of curious. You know, we're we're we guess, we're, we're, we're guesstimating. <laughs> we're we're estimating um, based on history, and you know, hopefully we are not wrong to a high level at the in the wrong direction. We we want to be wrong the way we were this right. year. Yeah, um, sure. and last year because we brought in fifty more mm -hmm. students last year. And and a lot of our timeline is based upon our employee bargaining contracts because our team members have rights and you know there's certain dates that we must put them on unrequested leave of absence so if we know that we have to make some budget adjustments or some cuts for lack of a better word you know we have to do those by a certain date I don't know if it's like April -ish. so yeah that's why we have to start early. Jason follows that I don't I don't have to know that <laughs> no, I don't today. He tells us when we have to know it. Thank you. All right. Um, history of the state increases to the formula. Um, if you look at uh, the next parameter, I, I've got a lot of years here um, going back to 2007-8. Um, I want you to look at 2014-15 and 15, 16, and 16, 17. You can see that we got one and a half percent on the formula in 2014, 15. But I want you to look at all of the tails on that. Location equity revenue of 212 brought in significant money. Declining enrollment revenue helps those districts that um, are declining um, the students. Um, 
and they funded all day every day pay for the first time. It wasn't was no longer running through. We got significant what I call tails. And we got that in 1415, we got tails in 1516, and we got tails in 1617. Uh, that had some significant impact. Um, sometimes it's not the formula dollars that help us out. Sometimes it's those tails. Uh, one of the tails they're talking about this year is special education funding. Um, I'm hoping that something happens there. It's an expensive area. Um, Steve told me, uh, he said, Michelle, our special ed count went up 70 students this year. So, of course, I had to run that report and look myself, and it did. Um, we brought in 130, about 135 new students, let's say. Half of them qualified for SPED. Doesn't mean that they were, you know, necessarily all the new students, but basically we had half of that number qualified for SPED services, and SPED is definitely a more expensive area than regular general ed. So um, Brian kind of mentioned that with our uh, early learners and that uh, we are seeing a lot more um, struggling students in that category. So, so that brings us to the years after, and as you can see, most of the years we received 2%, except for in 21-22, we did receive 2.45%. Uh, that was, the, I believe the 0.45 was added after um, that session was done, because uh, it all had to do with the pandemic. And then 22-23, we got 2%. So the question is, what is 23, 24 going to bring us? As I mentioned, one of the tales they're talking about is special education. Um, I'm thinking we can bank on at least 2%. I'm not quite sure when the governor, you know, the governor, the yes. House and the Senate send out their whole list of priorities and what they're banking on for, you know, percentages on the formula. I'm very interested to see what that looks like this time around with all Democrats um, holding the House and the Senate and the governorship. Now, just because the Democrats are all in charge, if you go back to 1314, uh, that was one and a half percent with the Democrats in 1213, it was one and one percent we got literacy aid. So, you know, you gotta be careful, but they are talking about a lot of stuff. We're, we're getting good vibes. So the question is, what are those good vibes going to be in the end? I just forwarded the board an email I received today from our associations. Um, yeah, it, it's just a matter of days you're going to see all this stuff coming out. So the, we they released what they're calling the One Minnesota package from the governor. So you can read that for yourself. It, I, I looked through it, didn't have like specifics this much percentage here, this much, but it did show the priority areas in there. So they haven't gotten down to where the governor hasn't released you. He's going to put Not that I can see in that. So I, I'm interested in that. I'm waiting for it, but we have to wait. Um, we will start with a parameter that you will set. Um, you know, I wouldn't recommend going lower than 2%. But you, you can tell us, well, we think it's going to be better, so do 3%. Somebody could say, I don't think it's going to be that good. It'll be one and a half. So, um, but I would say we would start it at 2%. Highly unlikely. Highly unlikely. Yeah. I, 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 I we're going to feel it. Yeah. <laughs> With, yep. with the special education tales of significant mon money. Yeah, if we could control all that, we don't. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll be watching the legislature. Um, ben gets updates, you get updates, I get updates. Some of us get all the same updates. I did not see the governor really so So Ben, if you would share that with me. I, 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 yeah. 
Um, and then negotiations would be the other parameter, and we will need to um, close the board meeting to talk about our initial thoughts on that. I'll have to look when we did that either not last or all. Because there are some years that we do we only have the enrollment parameters set. Um, it's every other. Let's sneeze again. Um, Michelle, would you recommend that we go on the closed session to discuss the negotiation? Not tonight. No, no not tonight, but yes. next month. It will. Next yeah. meeting. I'll have Emily look up when we did okay. it last year. Or two years ago. It would be two years ago. That wasn't last year. It was the year before. Okay. See when we did it, but I would say that next month would probably be the, the initial start of that conversation. And then I did some budget analysis for you. These are not based on the actual revised budget. They are conceptual only. So please realize that they are only conceptual. This is not what the final um, estimates for re any adjustments to the budget will look like. Uh, we are just working through uh, the expenditures and, and we got a lot of work yet there and I haven't touched revenue for the only sign. So. Um, I'm going to skip over the 122 and just go right to the 145. The concept is the same on both of them. So um, at the top left there, you can see our fund balances from 2018 through 22, and that is our unassigned fund balance. We have fund balances in our reserves. We have assigned categories that have fund balances. This is just our unassigned area. This is what operates the district's pays. The teacher keeps our lights on, pays to clean the buildings, that kind of thing. Um, so, um, our um, original budget showed our variance at one, a negative 1. 1.6 million. So that is what we started with um, in the unassigned category. Now remember, this isn't showing any detail here, but we have COVID money, one-time COVID money. Um, that COVID money will start coming up next year. So you'll see how that functions with. But what I did is I moved our revised um, 23, I moved over to uh, those little boxes on the side and I took our revenue and I increased um, our 145 students and put an estimate in there of about 1.1 million. Uh, special education uh, as of right now shows that we're gonna go up about 75,000 in revenue. And then um, that would give us a new revenue total of about 35, six for um, current year in a conceptual picture. Uh, our expenses were 36 million, just over. Um, we did some salary and benefit increases. This, these numbers are just plug numbers. They are not actual. We are working on the actual right now. Um, we will have finance. We will have our initial revised budget to them um, in our first finance meeting in February. But uh, let's say salary and benefits were 350000 and other increases. Uh, this has to do with, you know, fuel. More buildings and grounds. <laughs> oh my goodness, I both fell over with the personal fall bill. I'm waiting for the second one. I might fall over over that, that one. That 350 includes any new teachers or parents that we hired. Yeah, it's a very rough estimate. Yeah. Very rough. So um, if you look at that, that gives us a variance of just under a million, uh, which which is where we are a lot of years. Mm -hmm. And we usually come out okay because we underspend our expenditures usually by at least a percent. And we um, 
you usually come in a little bit better on revenue. You know, some years we're only a half a percent over, but other years, you know, it, it's 1% or 2% revenue comes in better. It's everything we do is our best estimate. Um, so then I rolled this forward into 23-24. Um, and I in this conceptual picture, I, I just did a loss of 20 kids for these. Um, so that's you know about 150,000 students or $150,000 in students. <laughs> We'd need a much bigger district for 150,000 students. Uh, 2% from the state now would be about 475,000. Um, we have a nice increase in basic skills or compensatory revenue coming in for next year um, based on um, the state and federal government partner to recognize students that are in Medicaid uh, automatically qualify for free and reduced. So that increases some of our funding areas. And for compensatory, that hits our books next year, not the current year. So that conceptually would give us uh, 36.8 in revenue for 24. Expenses, um, you know, we start with 36.6. Uh, salary and benefit increases, you know, all what we planned for last time, 100,000 more, you know, because our, our percentage is higher or not the percent is higher, but our base would be higher. Um, we have the one-time fund 19 money coming up. Um, and so conceptually right now, I got 600,000 in there. We're, we're gonna get that nailed down to exactly what that number would be um, for the revised budget. And then of course, any other increases, we'll have some transportation increases, um, buildings and grounds, um, Hopefully the inflationary factor is slowing down, but we have seen some, quite some jumps in some of the things that we are doing. Um, so that would give us a negative variance in this conceptual picture of 2 million. Um, and then I always look at, well, what is it if we land at 99% and what is it if we land at 98? And that can be between revenue and expenses. So. We, we can be at 99 for uh, expenses and 101%, and we got a 2% variance, but it, it's just easier to do it on the expense side per se, on the calculations. And, and you can see the reductions to maintain a 3.8 million fund balance. Um, there would be anywhere, depending on where you landed with the percents, anywhere from, a reduction of slightly over 300,000 all the way to 1.8 million if we hit all targets. Um, and we start watching those targets. As, once the revised budget is done, we, we start watching those percentages and how we are running compared to previous years. Um, and if we see anything on web, of course, we come back here and say, you know, we're, we're not gonna make this. Um, I haven't had to do that really here, um, but it may happen someday that we, we have something happen that requires us to spend more in our general custodial budget, let's say. I don't know what that might be, but um, we're off by 50,000. Well, that, you know, that might require a budget revision per se at that point. We wouldn't revise the whole budget, but we might revise part of the budget. So, um, typically though, we do the two. We do our original in, in June, and then we do a revised uh, in the February, March area. So any questions? Again, this is very conceptual. So don't lock any of those numbers in your head. <laughs> well, you can see how, you know, right now in the conceptual, she put in 2% for the state. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if we put in 3% or 4%, that number is going to change, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes. 
Yes, and there's no spend money in there yet. Mm -hmm. I didn't do any kind of calculation for that yet, but there were there's some spend money that we need to Typically, uh, that goes up as your salaries go up because you're reimbursed based on how much your costs are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Move to the next capital. Now, um, in finance, we discuss the um, weight room in a separate line item. I actually, the weight room is now in these budgets. So the 20, um, Ben, you sent out all of the weight room information. I think I saw that you sent that to the board, the schematic of what the weight room would look like. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. You all saw that. Yes. Good. And if anyone has any specific questions about the weight room, Brian has been a, a champion in moving that forward and been working with a lot of the vendors and things. So, just a, <laughs> you have him here tonight if you have any questions. I did ask uh, Carter if he wanted to come and address the board tonight. He said maybe at the next meeting. Um, but uh, this is uh, Carter Jolson, a sixth grader in our district, uh, is choosing to make a wish to uh, see this project through. Um, make a wish uh, channeled a couple different vendors, um, and uh, we're reaching out to some other vendors to get bids. Uh, Power Lift out of uh, Iowa uh, had the best partnership with Make a Wish with this. Uh, they're doing it at just above their cost and then uh, doing a $40,000 scholarship donation to our district if we move forward with this. So in essence, we're getting about $300,000 worth of equipment for $120,000 plus uh, whatever farm we decide to go with. Um, so it's right around that $150,000, um, we uh, haven't, uh, this last couple of weeks, we've been getting feedback from coaches, um, from um, high school staff, administration, um, involving middle school with it a little bit, because uh, the goal would be to be able to streamline some of that equipment down to the middle school as well, uh, to better use that space and facilities. Um, reached out to some uh, businesses in the area, Steinbrecher Painting and Minuteman uh, to see if they would like to partner with us on, on some of this. So um, we, there's a lot of different designs you can go with, um, but with our square footage, which is just about 1,500 square feet, we're pretty limited when you're looking at uh, 68 by 24. So we're trying to streamline this as best we can. Um, I remember when we moved that weight room uh, into that room, which was a storage room back when I went through school. And uh, we actually, um, Doug Patnode and I spent quite a bit of time measuring and, and looking at options and getting feedback from others. And um, really the plan that was shared with you right now is believed to be the best way we can, we can use that space with hopes of someday being able to add space and then carry this equipment into uh, that space. But I would think um, currently um, as a former activities director and at another Mississippi conference school, um, I would think that we would um, probably have the worst weight room facilities currently to one of the best after this project. Okay, so Carter, you're going to have uh, Carter to be our show for showcase maybe next month. Do you think he'd be willing to speak to Yeah, board? he'll probably come in and be pretty short, but okay. <laughs> he can. Well, we'll see where he yeah. where it's best to fit him yeah. in, but it would be great to hear his story. He he did uh, join me on a conference call with this company, um, and the, they're waiting for final approval. Um, once we get that approval, um, they would come up and they would tour, and we could adjust those plans uh, as needed uh, if we do move forward with it. Um, the, the other piece to this is the timing of it. Um, we have some uh, citywide uh, choir and band concerts in March. We want to avoid those. We want to, we have some spring coaches that are worried about space issues and using that weight room. So 
the time frame would be trying to clean out uh, that room in April, allow Keith and his crew to uh, really uh, make that space up to uh, get it up to speed. And then we would get the equipment, which is a, about a 16 week turnaround, get that in in May, um, get all the equipment out of gym three during this transition that that back gym. So it's out for graduation and then have it up and running for our summer program. So that's the goal of it. Um, if everything goes right and but as Keith can tell you, there's a lot of um, waiting for simple items right now. And so it's it's a lot of things that have to come together, but that's our general timeline if if we do move forward with this project. As far as my side of it goes, I'm over the throne right now too. My side of it would uh yeah, we're gonna talk about that on the LTFM. Okay. So just wait. <laughs> <laughs> excited I, I know but <laughs> I, I had to split them up based on the budget area so sorry um, <laughs> anyway um the equipment the actual equipment that the kids will be working on and uh the rubber mat the floor is not adhered to the floor those would be capital items and uh, the total is about one hundred fifty five thousand uh, dollars I have added it to the 23 um, capital budget uh, that does raise our variance now to um, now a negative 967,000. Um, everything was planned to drop that fund balance to about 1.9. So this will drop it to just under 1.8. It's, it's not a significant uh, drop, but that we'll talk about going forward what um, capital looks like with the next sheet so because we do want to get moving with this this will be on the next board meeting uh, to have this area up reapproved um, with your authority so that we can spend that long time. so that is the only change to the 23 capital budget as of right now with a large um yeah that's part of the correct teaching and learning plan okay two hundred thousand of that yeah. was planned to come out of capital that was okay. a one-time deal okay no. gotcha. yeah Thank yeah you. i have Thank notes you. all over that so i wouldn't forget that from that finance meeting um the 24 capital plan this again is um Basically, um, me just moving forward what we typically spend. And then we got a couple items that we we want to bring up, but um, I'm um, Our bond has now come up and we had been spending into fund balance that was a planned fund balance spend in that started when um, Julio was here, you know, quite a while ago. And we had, because we were only receiving part of our capital and we had more capital needs than what we were bringing in for revenue, um, we made the decision, the board made the decision that we, we could spend on our fund balance to below $2 million. So we have now done that. Um, going into 24, we, we will be at that point. So I took the estimated fund balance and our revenue now will jump up to about 775,000. Now, you know, I'll have harder numbers when we actually do this for the 24 budget, but um, I plugged in basically what we have. The only thing I changed was other equipment under building the grounds. I move that to 20,000 because basically we can't buy anything for under, it's between 15 and 20 for a piece of equipment in case area. It, there's just no getting around that. Is there Keith? No. I tried though. Um, so with just, just moving those things forward, um, we also keep a district-wide emergency, which is basically Keith. He spends that generally every year on us. Um, Yep, I know. 
the variance um, is still, um, it's showing us a negative 93,000. So to work with that variance and bring capital under control, we're, we're back into um, a positive situation or a flat situation. We will have to be working with software because a number of years ago, we moved software into capital to take stress off of our unassigned area. Well, now we might have to move some of that back. Um, the other thing is, and, and these aren't, um, we also have not talked about what technology, I mean, there, there's things that we will need to discuss yet for the 24 budget. Um, our student technology costs and those those types of things. But we also uh, have seven district vans. We have two aging out next school year. Um, so far, Keith and I have not been successful in finding replacements. Uh, you better order them now. <laughs> well, uh, it's more than that. For how long? It, didn't it take us a long time? To yes, it did. Oh my goodness, I am going to lose my battery. Um, Two, two vans could cost us $100,000. Um, I don't know if one of the vans is um, special ed. No, together. I got 60000 for the sped van and forty dollars if we don't need wheelchair accessibility. So sixty dollars if we need, you know, where they can roll the wheelchair in because we don't always get the wheelchair part. Um, it's a tough deal to find 10 passenger vans. If, if the DOT requires us to have 10 passenger vans, well, the only outfit that made 10 passenger vans anymore was Ford, and Ford took them off the assembly line last year. We couldn't even look at purchasing anything. So we're going to ask the question again, but we have basically put Palmer on notice that they're going to have to probably take over those two vans. Mm -hmm. um, and just so you know, they're having trouble finding. And I've got a call back in the Ford seeing if they're ever going to start this back up again with that 10 passenger. The guy from Ford I've known for a long time, he's, they're, they're lobbying the Department of Transportation to change their requirements for these 10 passenger vans. Maybe go back to a 15 or a 12 or something like that where it's easier to make, make them or something like that. It's really a strange situation. My dad is going to get one of those get key. Yep. Um, so there'll be more to come on our our vans. Uh, we also have some vehicles at the buildings and grounds and equipment for outside that is bigger. Um, we run, we have like a bobcat, we have a bucket truck, and we have a plow truck. Uh, <coughs> The plow truck is probably the next thing that we will need to look at. Um, so this was just us at a high level looking. Uh, we currently have a one ton, correct? Ton and a half. Ton and a half. So just us just Googling roughly, um, you know, what we aren't going to get much below that 100,000. <laughs> And it's, a, and it's a dire and that's need. used yeah it's it's a dire need because we're like put in perspective we're like the first responders when it's icy and snowy out so we're the ones that have to get there to take care of this stuff and without that we're sitting ducks in the water because trying to get the fall company out here like this is impossible yeah. mm -hmm. and it was to be to bring up put in perspective as well yesterday or monday when we had the snow or the ice issue the city happened to be closed, so we couldn't we get free salt and sand from the city. That's great. We go in there to dump it in a dump truck and we can use it. Well, they were closed for the holidays, so we went try to get in there. We couldn't. So I had to call my plow company in because we had already planned to get in there to get it. Well, it was three hours later before a plow company would come out with salt and sand. So boom. So we really need to have this truck on site to do what we can when we can do it. Same with a plow and a sander van on there ready. So it's 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 well needed. It really is. So I wanted to give you an initial um, preview of capital um, with what that looks like. Now that uh, our full funding is back at um, hundred percent coming into the next year. Um, 
Now, Keith, we can talk about the way room. <laughs> so we're going to go on to LTFM. And this also has part of the weight room conversation in here. Um, so so I can see it. Um, the two changes that um, are currently on here is the tennis court. They um, upped that by $100,000 after we got the last bids in. Um, just so you know, we are getting the better tennis court. It will last double the time of what an asphalt tennis court would look like. So even though the upfront costs look a little more than what we'd like them to look, uh, over the life of it, we, we will get more life out of these. Well, that's what they tell me. Um, and I asked them, why don't people, why haven't people been doing that? And they said, because of the way they were, are designed, um, they were way more expensive than an asphalt court. So, um, you know, districts and cities, and they, they just, they don't shell out that kind of money. And they put in the asphalt one. So, um, Plus that factor too is for some other reason the asphalt when nuts as far as expense goes mm -hmm. and the concrete stayed kind of flat so concrete might have user friendly expense now to put in so yeah so these bids were a hundred thousand dollars cheaper than our asphalt bids yeah. uh, and you approved this in our last board meeting mm -hmm. so. Um, but we do need to catch the budget up. You have given us the authority to go ahead with the contract, but um, we're catching the budget up. And then, of course, the next thing is weight room under the high school. Uh, right now, we have 50000 there. We're looking at sealing the floor um, to put the mat on top of, painting, lighting, and HVAC. And I will let Keith take over on what that all looks like. And right now, we're getting bids or quotes from um, Egan and Princeton Electric. So we kind of got a plug number in here. Yeah, we're looking at uh, to be able to get the equipment in here so they fit in the, uh, Brian's parameters of receiving it with all the offers that we have sitting on their table over there. Uh, worst case scenario, we can seal the floor before they put in a new floor and we can get it painted. And Steinbrecher painting has been really cool. They're going to throw in the graphics and the lettering and whatever we need uh, for their part of the deal for free. And then we'll, we'll pay for the painting and, and for the walls. And they're going to do a epoxy based coat to help from damage from the kids. And uh, so that can be done while we get everything out and we get in there and do that. The hard part is I've got a getting pricing rolling in on the lighting because we're going to redo the lighting because it's, it's like a cave in there. And we need some uh, better shatterproof lenses on there. Uh, and the HVAC, we're shooting a couple of different options for that. So if it comes down to our good old supply issues like we've been having, we can probably put the lighting in the HVAC, HVAC in after the fact. Well, I'm getting, like I say, I'm getting pricing on some of this. As soon as it gets in, we can add it to the, to the game and see how it plays out. But we're trying to get a good solid game plan set up here so when we get this equipment, then we can do what we have to do. So for the HVAC, we're looking at split units in there. Um, they heat and they cool because there is really... Right now in there, there is a unit heater that runs off the steam system, which is working us. And because that room gets so cold, it used to be a stove room. And uh, there is an exhaust fan they put in there, which really works relatively well, but there's nothing bringing fresh air or anything in there. And there's a proposal to drop a regular rooftop AC heating system, which would have been ridiculously expensive. So we chatted about it, and now we're looking at a split, like a, this stuff sits in the roof, and then your, your blower and everything is in the room, one on each end. So it moves the air and stuff, and that should save us a very good amount of money to do that. So where I'm having my contractors come to look at that here next week, check that out. So it's, we're trying to be really cost effective as well. So. And would that bring fresh air when yes. there? Yep. There it is. 
Oh, this is way different. <laughs> okay. All right. We got that covered for 23. So um, next board meeting, we will also be coming back with the revised LTFM for full approval um, to get us started. Um, we, we may have some adjustments to the weight room as we go along. Um, if they're not big, we won't have to really worry about them because we do have authority under general maintenance. Um, but if they're bigger, and we didn't have them in the initial, we may have to bring back a third time. So we're working as fast as we can. The one piece with the flooring, I know when Ben sent the email, there's a uh, flooring, two different quotes. Uh, one was like 22,000 and one was like 28. The difference is the thickness, uh, 22,000 would be a half inch. Um, right now we have old platforms that are in there that they can do the power clean and deadlift and hand clean, those type of activities. Uh, they're tripping hazards. Uh, they're falling apart. Um, if we did go with the one inch, the more expensive one, um, then uh, the weights and the flooring is designed that they, you can do the power clean, deadlift, all that right on the flooring. You would have, you could get rid of the platforms, the tripping hazards. That's all one piece. So it's a lot easier to maintain that space instead of the four by six mats that fall apart. And uh, I know I was in there the other day and there's four of them up on each other and it's it's not a safe environment. So that's the, the difference between the quote. Everything else is the same. Any questions about our weight room proposal? That affects two reserve categories. If we do, I'm going to pull a call or email away and I can get you the answers from whoever you'd like to talk to. Okay. Um, next is looking ahead to um, our 2324 proposed LTFM projects. Um, we've been working, Keith and I, with ICS on, um, you know, the next steps. Of what needs to happen with um, our long term facility maintenance. And we have to, of course, every year we adopt a 10 year monetary plan uh, that shows the, the ex expenses that we might have over the next um, 10 years, which always shows us in the big negatives by the end. Um, but we have to adjust that for what we actually have for funds. Um, so, uh, finance actually just saw this list uh, in December. Um, ICS worked and got us some numbers to plug into the areas uh, actually yesterday. And then we had Ellers run uh, what um, a $2.5 million bond that would come out of our LTFM uh, money that we're already levying for over a 10 year period and a $2 million bond over an eight. eight year um, period. So um, we, we've got a whole project list here. We got the high school kitchen ventilation and music room ventilation. So Keith, I'll let you explain what's going on there. Uh, I don't know if anybody you know on the board, but we had, we froze a bunch of pipes out of the kitchen at the high school over that nasty, windy, cold stuff. You know, due to some air handlers, that are way out of date and not working properly that we cannot fix anymore. So that's why that, that's why these are we're getting revised estimates as well because these are estimates from the middle or end of last year, I believe, because we've been looking at this in the, in the past. Um, then we've got the IS dish room now. Um, <laughs> we are inspected by the Minnesota Department of Health a couple times a year. This year they shut down our middle school dish room. Um, so um, our dish machine is not holding temp there appropriately, um, and they have been struggling with it for a number of years. So that machine uh, needs to be replaced. And that that's a plug and play situation, we believe, so we don't think it'll have any impact on the district, but uh, or on LTFM. It'll obviously will cost food service because they can pay for the dish machine. They also need the IS dish room updated, but that will affect LTFM because we need to look at flooring, moving plumbing, 
uh, electrical. It's a total revamp in there. Yeah. Um, so we, we've got a number for that. Um, like I said, we haven't got actual quotes yet, but um, ICS came up with a quote. Um, the dish machine again for the IS area would be covered by food service, but all of the construction part of it would have to be covered by LTFM. And then we got the middle school cooler. Yeah. So if you recall last year, we had the freezer cooler down here for the middle school. And I thought mm -hmm. that was taken care of, but we're still having some issues. We're having, well, we did took care of the freezer issue itself. The, when they initially built that back in 2000, they had the fans, when you open the freezer door, the fans would cool to free, keep the freezer going. Would suck all the humid air, humid air in from the from the kitchen, and it freeze all the coils in there. And we also had a problem with uh, bleed over because the, the insulation is pouring a floor in between the in, in between the uh, cooler and the freezer. So we thought that might take care of this too. But we switched and put a new uh, coil freezer coil and stuff in there, and that completely took away our freezing issue, and that keeps that would shut down the sit. The unit itself because it, it will freeze and just shut down because it's awful ice. So that took care of that and it's been running great. Well, this other issue did not go away. So there's some options. We're going to try it cheaply first, but if it doesn't work, then we have to go to the next level. We're going to try to re insulate me mechanically, put some insulation in there. Hopefully, that might take care of this little bleed through because we're getting frost in the cooler floor in there. And if it goes out enough, it starts melting and creates a, a slip hazard in there for the cooks. We're trying to do it the cheapy way first and get it done, and hopefully it takes care of it. If it doesn't, then we may have to think about replacing part of the cooler itself or maybe part of the floor. We're trying to assess that. So again, the cooler would be covered by food service, but the floor would be adhered to the building, so that's healthy <clears> then. <throat> Uh, the IS domestic hot water has been on our list for a little while. Um, oh, I skipped the rest of that lift, didn't I? We are finally getting somewhere with the rest of that <laughs> lift that went down how many years ago? Yeah. Um, we we don't have it all nailed down, um, but. We're getting there. Yeah, the other I saw today in an email was way less than a hundred thousand. Uh, no, all you saw was the lift. That doesn't include fixing the six joists or anything. This is just the plug number. There's, we have no idea. Yeah, the structural engineer was out. He did the structural because if we're going to hang it off the ceiling or the wall, they have to do a structural analysis because of that load off the off the roof because that is, those mats are super heavy and it. I don't have the report yet. They're getting the report prepared, but I do know that they're going to have to add some bracing in there to make the structure sound so we can hang it up there. And it'll be able to take away the liability. So we're waiting on that to see what kind of numbers we're going to have to have to structurally redo it. Because before, whoever did it years ago, before I was here, didn't ever had that structural done and things were bending up there and stuff. And that's why we took it down. We condemned it. Sort of moving forward on that one. So we're moving forward. The hundred thousand really is a plug number. We have no idea on the structural part yet. So, um, and of course, uh, the quote we got on the equipment was before the inflation factor. So that'll probably be higher too. Um, I guess as the domestic hot water, we originally had planned to do that. We're hoping to do that when we did the boiler up update to that building and we didn't have enough funding at the time so we have pushed that off now what three years mm -hmm. um, so we're looking at about 112,000 to do that and then the, that was that that was a bid so we took the oh, bid okay. and we upped it because okay. we got an actual we got actual bids. Yeah. Well, yeah, so there's an inflationary factor okay. in that. Okay. Um, like I said, these would all be updated to actual, but we needed some yeah. numbers. Yeah. To, uh, the high school roof, these numbers are probably uh, pretty close. And of course, 
uh, the high school roof would have to um, go out for bid. But we have two, three sections, two little sections and the science area that are still the rubber roof from 1994. So that's aged out by quite a few years because those first rubber roofs that they put on were, were rated for about 15 years. So we pushed that quite a ways. Kind of like our portables, huh? Yep. <laughs> Just keep on pushing it forward. Um, a lot of patches on it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, we 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 got the the quotes from Garland on what that would look like, and then we have this big HVAC project. Keith, you want to walk through the, all the phases of this? Nope. <laughs> We've done phase one already at the middle school, and I think a couple at intermediate. But uh, I'm going to go right into phase. First part of phase two, it would be centrally locating our automation server to one unit because each building has their own server and all this, and it gets really complicated when guys are trying to work on it. It's not efficient, and we need to upgrade it to the modern era because it's had, one's 10 years old, one's 15, one's five years old, and it needs to so centrally locate all our build, buildings to one service that can go on there and look at it and boom, 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 check this one, boom, 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 check this. So you're driving over town, trying to figure out one building from another. Mm -hmm. uh, then moving to phase two, HVAC controllers are what the automation computer looks at and tells the unit what to do. And either make it cooler, make it hotter. Well, all these two next two phases, those controllers, they don't make them anymore. It's like anything mechanical, things change, they get better, supposedly. And uh, we, we, we're going to come in another couple of years, we're not going to be able to get them anymore, which means if they fail, like some of these are, like the middle school, where they'd fail and you lose program from your commuter to the unit, or it either, depending on the time of the year, it either stay, if it's cold out, it stay wide open hot, or if it's hot outside, it stay wide open cold. So, and you can see where that's going to go. So we were trying to be proactive and start getting these things changed out because the ones we pulled out of the middle school, some of them were still good, some of them weren't. So we bench stocked them in case something goes down now so we can still change it out without having to try to hunt down this stuff at a plus of it, an exorbitant cost these people do have because they know they're being phased out. So we're trying to knock these out as we can. And that's why uh, phase three, it's the same thing. We're just doing different schools. And the phase three is, could be a phased out a couple of years if need be. But like they're phasing out as well, but they're a little bit newer than these older ones are. So it's kind of a step ladder kind of thing where we're, we're trying to keep up with it and get it changed out. And it's all proprietary. It doesn't matter if it's Egan companies, whose that's automation we use, if it's uh, climate makers. Climate makers or, or uh, another outfit, they've all got their own proprietary systems. So you can't just go in there and, okay, let's try these guys and don't work that way. If we bring somebody else in, you have to tear it all out, which would be millions oh, of dollars. Yeah. So that's why we're trying to stay up on this to not drop a big bunch of money at once, which, yeah, this is big, but not what it could be. And we also don't want to have something go down and we don't have a part. It, yeah, and it also saves us money because our guys are not automation qualified to run the automation per se. They can do a little bit, but it really gets technical with all these valves and sensors and all this. So we have an automation, Egan's automation side of it. We'll, we'll call them and they'll log in remotely and they'll fix it for us. Well, that's the cost. And that's about 350 bucks a pop for those guys to go to log in, try to figure it out, work with my guys. To get it squared up, they may have to run up there and adjust something. And then they reprogram this controller that went down because it loses, like I said, it loses program. It could last months, it could last a week and go down again. So it's it's aging out its mechanical equipment. So it's... There you go with that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You're just a ray of sunshine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
That's my text message is over Christmas. But, oh my God, what did you right now? <laughs> um, then uh, we have been talking about the high school bathrooms. Um, this would be um, updating our high school bathrooms with plumbing, you know, a couple extra doors. Um, and uh, this would cover two sets, 250,000 set, one on each level. Um, we have been talking about that for quite a while. Um, and then I did throw in a number for flooring because we do have flooring that needs to be updated in our high school and our intermediate school. Those buildings are our oldest and some of it's pretty wore out. Like they're mostly carpet? Uh, no, not necessarily. The high school has um, some of those classrooms are um, BCT tile, yeah. I believe. And some entry to entry, entryway at the high school needs to be looked at as well. So that's tile. Yeah, there, there's a lot Cafeteria's of- Cafeteria's tile that needs to be looked yeah. at. There's some big cracks in that cafeteria. And I, but anyway, I put a number there. That's just a bug number. It's because in the scheme of things, the flooring is, you know, if we can get it done, great. But it's not going to trump the roof that's leaking or the controllers in our mind um, that can shut our buildings down with no heat in the wintertime. So um, we've... We, we called Ellers, as I said, and had them run us uh, two scenarios with two and a half million dollars and one with two million. As you see, uh, the current numbers are coming to just, you know, under 2.8 million. So even with the $2.5 million bond, we would not be able to cover all of it. We're, we're gonna have to um, take some things off of this to, to make that work for, for that size of size of a bond and I gotta ask Joey if it's the whole 2.5 or is I gotta subtract off you know all those fees we gotta pay for selling the bond. Uh, and then I had to run a two million dollar over eight years. That the difference is the number of years. And of course like Ben and I talked here, you're paying more interest over the 10 years versus the eight. And then of course we can try and do this without a bond. Um, we can do what we can each year. And it it will take things off the table because there is just no way we're going to be able to do the roof with our yearly amount. So, so roof such an expensive mm -hmm. project that you almost will have to do some kind of a bond so we we can get that money up front. And the board uh, should be familiar if you've been on the board for more than a few years. This is something that we. We did. did as recently as what, four years ago. Four years ago, and yeah. it's just it's a way for us to get money up front um, based upon money that we're basically a hundred percent sure that we will be getting over the next ten years. The downside is to get the money up front, you do have to pay interest on that. Well, it gives you immediate cash flow. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. What are interest rates now compared? I mean, they're um, well, you know, on a bond like this. Um, she she calculated them out at four percent, and she always tells me, "Yes, I took into consideration the feds. We came in better on the abatement by than what sorry than um, what um, she had originally proposed." And you know, I, I don't want to say this too loud, but we have. We've done very well when we sold our bonds. We 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 have a good. Um, we just did the abatement bond, and we kept our rating even with the negative one point six million. So if we do this now, we're still going to have a good rating. And the state jumped big in their rating, and with those two ratings, um, they want to typically give Princeton money. So. Um, that's a good thing. We'll take it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I really, you know, when Keith and I did this this morning, because like I said, we we met with, um, we were emailing I, ICS last week trying to get them to meet with us. And we're, we're just the, the list of questions. And Monday, they kept saying Monday. Well, Monday is the day before the board meeting. 
Um, so this morning we we sat down and, and looked at, you know, quickly as best we could what we would prioritize. Um, but we may change that prioritization because you know the kitchen ventilation doesn't look so hot. Something's got to be done there. So that may trump out something else. Um, if, if we didn't have a bond, you know. Why don't we do a three million dollar bond and get all projects? Because we have to have operating each year. We have to bring in. I want you know about five hundred fifty to six hundred dollars coming in because just our regular expenses that we're putting in there is about three hundred fifty, and then you have projects that come up that have no rhyme or reason. They're not you, even you on the list for a rooftop unit, and they usually cap for all a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. So right, you don't want to get zero. With a two and a half million dollar bond, you have to take something off of this list in order to come. Yes. So I don't know what what that might be. Well, I don't know what the purpose of take if these are needs. Well, why don't we get our needs? We met? can do the controller phase three. Um as you see oh, when no, when we bond. that's the one that we would oh, take off because <laughs> those are we the newer controllers. Well, Keith is telling me we can do that. Yeah. And then in three years, we'll be starting on the next eight-year bond, which should be higher because that bond was 3.9. And Ryan said, wasn't that 4.5? And I started laughing. I said, yes, it is. And then the auditors came that year. I kept saying 4.5 because that was the year that they gave us a lot of money to borrow our money. <laughs> Yeah, so we had 4.5 million basically to spend, but we had sold a 3.9 million dollar bond. <laughs> you know, one thing that could put your mind at ease a little bit with the whole idea of bonding and not having to pay the interest is it likely would be somewhat of a wash because with some of these projects, if we waited five years to do, you know, with inflation, it likely would eat all of that up. And if we had an emergency, we could wipe out, you know, if we had controllers go down in this $250,000 pot of money, um, it's going to cost us more than $250,000 because we're going to be shutting down school because we have no heat. Mm -hmm. I mean, not that something can't happen that would, would do that anyway, but if we know we're in this situation where we're stockpiling parts and we're counting on the guys that go around fixing these and taking these out of buildings that are upgrading and hoarding them. Um, you, you know, that's not a good plan for the future. So next time, um, I will bring this back um, for your approval on either a 2.5 or a 2 million. That will be your choice. Um, of course, Keith and I would recommend the 2.5. Um, and the other thing with interest is that typically during the bond cycle, there's a time frame that we can call up those bonds are callable, meaning that we can um, we do them if interest drops and we're gonna save so much. And we have done that on a number of our bonds through the years. So um, just because we end with one rate doesn't mean that we won't um, be able to lower that rate in the future. It's just like your home loan. Mm -hmm. As soon as you see that dive to 2%, you're out there going, I need to refinance. Well, mm -hmm. we do the same thing when it's, when the bond is legally callable. So they watch that for us, and they're very good about sending us those notices. Um. Ready to move on to that? It's LTFM, I think. And I, I'll let you look at the, the stuff from Tellers on your own. All right. Thank you, Michelle, for all that hard work. Thank you. Keith, thank you. And if you guys ever want to take a look at some of this equipment or something, more than happy to take the round to a look at it. I mean, it's Take right up and show you where the both pipes were and why and all that kind of stuff. stuck in the rope, but it might be fun. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you. We'll move
move on to family center spaces issues. Okay, so this is a quick one. You're you're aware that uh, we have no more space, and we have waiting lists. <laughs> we have waiting lists uh, for programming. Uh, so you know, really, you got three options. One is to do nothing and just continue to have waiting lists and say we are sorry we can't serve you. Two would be to find some space to lease, which that would be the um, quickest solution. Uh, and three would be to build that into some kind of a future uh, referendum bond to go out to the voters. Um, so what I'm recommending as a starting point is for us to, um, I guess, review or analyze different options in the community for leasing. And there is uh, one place that I would like to uh, schedule a time for our long range planning committee, or at least a member or two of that committee to join me and probably Brian and maybe Keith and Michelle to go do a, a tour of that space. And uh, I believe it's called Trini Trinity, Trinity Crossing. Crossing. Oh, right across the which is just right like across, right across the road maybe a block away or two blocks away. Yeah, it's just one big open space. No, I've I've been in contact with the president of their church board and their priest, minister, pastor. Um don't know the correct term there, but pastor. um and you know they would they would love to have us come in and tour the space and just have a discussion. So I guess I wanted to give you a heads up that I will try and coordinate that. Uh, he did indicate that he doesn't want to interrupt their current leaser, if you will. I don't know if they have some daycare or child care in there. Right, child. So we would probably be looking at sometime in the late afternoon, early evening, or even look at an option for like a Saturday morning or Sunday morning or something. So I'll get those options and I'll send it to the long range planning committee. Was there any other buildings you were looking at? There is there are not. However, I we're we're totally open. So like if any of you are aware of other reasonable spots for us to check out, um and I'll we'll give them a call and we'll start talking. So this is the first one. I mean, uh, I had several people indicate that this might be an option. So that was my first call. Okay. The location is convenient too. It's not far from here. Right. Especially when we have to factor in transportation for some of these mm -hmm. students, uh, not just parent transportation, but our transportation. Right. It, and, and I also just want, you know, we would keep an open mind. Like we do know that we have waiting lists for some um, early childhood programming, um, but that doesn't mean that the early childhood would go in that space. Maybe we would reassign, for example, and I'm just throw out the idea. Maybe our onward, who has a space, what is it, just on the other side of that wall? You know, we could repurpose that and then potentially have onward in a new location. I mean, anything's on the table, I guess. We can just look at whatever makes the most sense. Well, and um, also, if we you had three options, you had A, B, and C. I would hope that we would do B now and think about C. Mm -hmm. <laughs> B B would be the you know the immediate option. C would be we we'd have to talk about that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I'm aware that there was some uh, factions that were promoting. Uh, like an early childhood wing on the primary school, you know, back in the day. We should have done it. Um, and it just didn't happen. And so I guess those are all future discussions for us to have. Yeah. And I'd love to, if you're up for ever a tour of the family center, I could uh, do that. We, we did do some remodeling in there. Um, back in 2016. Mm -hmm. um, was I guess that would be another option if we want to throw a D option that would be trying to remodel. Uh, some, but it's already been done and and if we're doing that we'd have to ship 
some offices or, or staff people, um, that could be another option. Well, and I would even throw our, you know, our district center open for discussion, but the, 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 the issue with that is I think that is, yeah, we don't own, we don't own, we don't own that no. where, where my office is right. and our offices are. This year though, we, we own this part on the other side of the wall. So it's kind of a weird situation, like with this big hospital building, one building, but it's parts of it are owned by different people. So could we get a discount? We got rent here for like right now, 19 years. <laughs> <laughs> Almost the we length of um, for our renovation. <laughs> okay, that's all I got on that. All right. There are no action items, um, no additions to the agenda, future meetings, um, February uh, 7th, and um, take a motion to adjourn. So Motion by Chad, second by second. Melissa. All in favor say aye. Aye. aye.